On December 8, 1941, the United States went to war with Japan after the surprise air attack on Pearl Harbor. By May 1942, Japan controlled much of the Pacific, including the Philippines and the former British and Dutch colonies in Southeast Asia. But two and a half years later, the tide had turned in the Pacific. Two parallel American drives had shrunk the former Japanese empire and decimated the Japanese carrier force. The drives would come together with landings in the Philippines. In June 1944, the Imperial Japanese Navy attempted to defeat the U.S. Pacific Fleet in the Battle of the Philippine Sea. But during this encounter, Inexperienced Japanese carrier air crews were shot out of the sky in what later became known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. Three Japanese carriers were sunk. The Japanese carrier force, which once spearheaded the Japanese offensive in the Pacific, was reduced to a mere shadow. By October 1944, it was evident that an American strategy to defeat Japan, beginning with landings in the Philippines, was about to be launched. The ultimate success or failure of the U.S. advance would soon rest on the shoulders of two experienced naval commanders, America's William Bull Halsey and Japan's Takeo Kurita. William Frederick Halsey was born in New Jersey in 1882, the son of a naval captain. In 1904, Halsey attended the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis, where he was a model student and a first-class athlete. After Annapolis, Halsey was rated an outstanding junior naval officer by his superiors. During World War I, he commanded a destroyer patrol force in the Atlantic and won the Navy Cross. Between the wars, Halsey served as the U.S. Naval Attaché in Scandinavia and Germany. In 1935, at age 52, he qualified as a naval pilot. This experience confirmed his belief in the value of carrier-borne aircraft in the future of the U.S. Navy. A year later, Halsey commanded his first aircraft carrier as a captain. By 1938, he was a rear admiral and led the recently formed Carrier Division II, this included the new carriers Enterprise and Hornet. When the Japanese launched their attack on Pearl Harbor, Halsey's carriers were at sea. The Japanese failure to locate and destroy them that fateful day would cost them in the months to come. Halsey then came under the command of Admiral Chester Nimitz, the new commander of the Pacific Fleet. In April 1942, Halsey coordinated the carrier-launched bomber attack on Tokyo, known as the Doolittle Raid. Halsey was out of action with a serious skin ailment until September of that year. But he returned in time to lead the South Pacific Force. He added much-needed steel to U.S. naval operations during the final stages of the campaign to secure Guadalcanal in the Solomons. After his promotion to full admiral, Halsey took over the U.S. Third Fleet in March 1943. It had been created out of the South Pacific Force. The same month, he began reporting to General Douglas MacArthur, with whom he immediately established an excellent rapport. Halsey's weather-beaten features, rough-and-ready nature, and aggressive manner earned him the nickname Bull. His direct, decisive style was a significant factor in the success of MacArthur's island hopping strategy in the Southwest Pacific. Halsey was uncompromising in his attitude toward the enemy. Halsey's third fleet moved into the Central Pacific in June 1944, once again under the command of Nimitz. It assisted in the drive across the Central Pacific. By October, Halsey was a key player in the U.S. Navy and was prepared to defeat the Japanese at Leyte Gulf. 
Takeo Kurita was born in Tokyo in 1889 and grew up in an academic family. But Kurita was determined to become a sailor. He joined the Etajima Naval Academy in 1906. Four years later, he graduated as an officer from the Imperial Japanese Navy. He then served with distinction on a number of cruisers and destroyers before attending Naval Staff College in 1917. After Staff College, Kurita specialized as a weapons officer and became an expert in submarine and torpedo tactics. During the 1920s, Commander Kurita was an instructor in torpedo warfare. Like Halsey, he supported the concept of carrier-borne aircraft becoming vital weapons in naval warfare. Over the next two decades, Kurita would be a key player in the development of Japanese torpedo and naval air operations. By the end of 1930, he was commanding a destroyer flotilla as a captain. His successful leadership earned him a promotion to Rear Admiral in 1938. In May 1942, after another promotion, Kurita commanded the Japanese Third Fleet during the battles for Midway, Guadalcanal, and Santa Cruz. In August 1943, he was appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Japanese Second Fleet. The fleet fought at the Battle of the Marianas and Philippine Sea in June of 44. After these disastrous encounters, the Japanese Navy had only one major surface force left, Kurita's Second Fleet. The Japanese fleet was based in the Dutch East Indies, which had become its major source of fuel. In early October 1944, Kurita received orders to prepare for a do-or-die attack on the U.S. fleet threatening the Philippines. This would bring him into direct confrontation with the U.S. Third Fleet's commander, Bull Halsey. Back in March 1944, as the two U.S. drives in the Pacific began to converge, the American chiefs of staff agreed that both should target Formosa, today known as Taiwan, before heading for Japan itself. General Douglas MacArthur, commanding the Southwest Pacific Theater, disagreed. He argued for an attack on the Philippines. After an inconclusive debate, MacArthur and Nimitz met President Roosevelt on July 26, 1944, at Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt agreed in principle to the MacArthur option, but made no firm decision. On the 1st of September, the U.S. Joint Chiefs finally approved MacArthur's plan to invade the Philippines. It involved attacking the southern island of Mindanao and then Leyte. Within days of this conference, Halsey recommended that the initial strike target Leyte. Thanks to his intelligence staff, MacArthur realized that the Philippines were more strongly held by the Japanese than Halsey thought. But MacArthur was obsessed with fulfilling his promise to the Filipino people. When he had been forced to withdraw in 1942, he declared that he would return. He seized on Halsey's bold idea to attack the heart of the Philippines. In mid-September 1944, he informed the Joint Chiefs that he would be ready to assault Leyte on October 20. The plan was immediately endorsed. MacArthur's grand scheme was supported by an impressive array of naval, air, and ground forces. The invasion force would consist of the U.S. 6th Army sent to assault Leyte, supported by the U.S. 7th Fleet. It would be protected by a defensive screen created by Halsey's 3rd Fleet. The 6th Army's 200,000 men were led by Lieutenant General Walter Kruger. The supporting U.S. 7th Fleet, with almost 750 vessels, was commanded by Admiral Thomas Kincaid. Kincaid's job was to put Kruger's 6th Army ashore and sustain them.
the 7th Fleet was to be shielded by Halsey's 3rd Fleet. The 3rd would not only protect the warships and the 6th Army's transports, but also defend the entire operation against any Japanese naval threat. The U.S. Invasion and Protection Force would be the largest, most powerful fleet ever assembled in the Pacific. Though MacArthur had direct command over Kincaid and Kruger, he did not control Halsey's third fleet, which reported directly to Chester Nimitz. This ensured that Nimitz had an active role to play. But it gave the American plan a potentially fatal flaw. No single overall commander. The situation was ripe for misunderstandings even before the battle began. In particular, Halsey was faced with a dilemma. What would he do if Carita's forces intervened? His orders were to cover the Leyte operation for MacArthur, but he was also told to destroy the enemy fleet under Nimitz's direction. It was in character for Bull Halsey to favor the second option. But this would jeopardize Kincaid and Kruger, who might be exposed to attack while Halsey was engaged elsewhere. The whole US plan was fraught with risk. The Americans hoped that the Japanese could not respond in force and jeopardize the Allied landings at Leyte. By autumn 1944, the Japanese Naval High Command realized that if the Americans reconquered the Philippines, the war would be lost. So a radical plan was developed to prevent this. After the fall of the Marianas, Admiral Suemu Toyoda commander-in-chief of the Imperial Japanese Navy, devised a contingency plan codenamed Shogo, or Operation Victory. It had four separate parts. Sho-1 dealt with the threat to the Philippines, considered the most likely target for an American attack. The remaining Sho plans covered other enemy approaches to the Japanese mainland. It was a strategy born of desperation. It risked the total destruction of the remaining Japanese naval forces. Show 1 aimed to destroy the Americans at Leyte. From Borneo, Force Alpha, commanded by Corita himself, would pass through the San Bernardino Strait to attack Leyte from the north. Commanded by Vice Admiral Shoji Nishimura, the second group of Corita's first strike force, codenamed Force Charlie, would weave its way through the Surigao Strait and attack from the south. Meanwhile, Vice Admiral Shima's second strike force would sail from the north and reinforce Nishimura. Finally, Vice Admiral Ozawa's carrier group, the first mobile fleet, would act as a decoy. Using his four aircraft carriers as bait, he would lure Halsey's third fleet away from Leyte. The first and second strike forces aimed to neutralize Thomas Kincaid's seventh fleet, isolate the US forces on shore, and establish conditions for a Japanese counterattack. Kurita realized his success would depend on Ozawa's ability to lure Halsey's carriers away from Leyte Gulf. He knew that Ozawa had only 116 planes aboard his four carriers. Nevertheless, Kurita believed that he could win a sensational victory. When the American intention to invade Leyte became clear on October 17, 1944, Toyota signaled to his task force commanders that Shogo was on. The stage was now set for the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Halsey and Corita would soon face a life or death battle. By the autumn of 1944, the U.S. Navy in the Pacific was one of the largest naval forces in history. The carriers were the pride of the Pacific Fleet. They had replaced the battleship as the sovereign of the seas. Carriers had been instrumental in the U.S. naval successes against the Japanese. Many American sailors were now hardened combat veterans, confident of their ability to keep inflicting defeats on the Japanese. During the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot in June 1944, 
U.S. naval aviators realized that Japanese aircraft were largely obsolete and had little chance against the more modern U.S. aircraft. U.S. carrier planes included the Grumman Hellcat fighter. and the devastating Corsair fighter bomber, more than a match for any Japanese aircraft. The planes had a top speed of almost 400 miles per hour and were heavily armed with cannons, machine guns, and either rockets or bombs. Above all, the naval crews believed in their commanders, especially Admiral Halsey. In contrast, Japanese naval personnel and air crews had witnessed a steady decline from the high watermark of Japanese fortunes in the spring of 1942. Most of their carriers and veteran air crews now lay at the bottom of the ocean. The remaining naval pilots were now very inexperienced and their aircraft increasingly obsolete. But Kurita knew he could still rely on the Japanese servicemen's courage and unquestioning sense of duty. The Japanese were now fighting to keep U.S. forces from reaching their homeland. They were determined to make them pay for every yard. The traditional Japanese warrior spirit was as strong as ever. Above all, they were devoted to Emperor Hirohito. Most were prepared to die for him. At home and at the front, these were desperate times that called for drastic measures. The Japanese would now unleash a new and diabolical weapon, kamikaze, or suicide attack. The term kamikaze means divine wind. It was derived from a legendary Japanese victory in medieval times. Many kamikazes were inspired by the Bushido tradition of self-sacrifice. Others simply volunteered to die gloriously for the emperor. Most kamikaze pilots were given little training before they were sent on their mission against U.S. ships. They were to conduct their suicide attacks from land-based airfields. Their aircraft were nothing less than flying bombs, which they crashed into U.S. warships. They were very difficult to defend against, as Halsey soon discovered. Courage would define U.S. and Japanese sailors and airmen at Leyte Gulf. But the core of the battle would be a clash of warriors between Bull Halsey and Takeo Kurita. The battle for Leyte began on October 17, 1944, when U.S. Army Rangers landed on several small islands protecting Leyte Gulf. At last, Kurita and the Japanese Imperial Navy High Command confirmed the target. On the 18th, the Navy's Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Toyoda, initiated the Show 1 attack on the U.S. fleet. The next day, Kincaid's U.S. 7th Fleet began pounding Leyte. Aircraft from the escort carriers strafed and bombed the designated landing points, as well as the enemy rear areas. In the early morning of the 20th, four divisions of Kruger's U.S. 6th Army stormed ashore near Dulag in the south and Takloban in the north.
The Japanese defenders were taken by surprise. Resistance was inconsistent at first. Kruger was determined to push his invasion force inland. He did so over the next 48 hours and quickly isolated the Japanese garrison. But help was at hand for the beleaguered Japanese on Leyte. The Imperial Japanese Navy, headed by Kurita, was on its way to intercept the American 7th Fleet. Kurita knew that if the 7th Fleet was destroyed quickly, Kruger's men would be isolated and vulnerable to a Japanese counterattack. By the evening of October 22nd, Japanese attack forces, as well as Ozawa's decoy carrier force, neared their positions close to Leyte. The Japanese naval attack force began to close in. Kurita was preparing to steam through the Palawan Passage and then through the San Bernardino Strait to Leyte Gulf. The Palawan Passage was, at that time, patrolled by two U.S. submarines, the Dace and the Darter. At 1.15 a.m. on the 23rd, their radars picked up a surface contact in the Palawan Passage. They quickly followed and soon spotted a large group of enemy vessels. They sent a contact report. This gave Halsey his first indication of Corita's strength and position. During the night, the submarines prepared to attack. At 6 a.m., the USS Darter fired six torpedoes at the first ship in the line of enemy vessels. The target was Corita's own flagship, the Otago. She was hit by four torpedoes and sank 18 minutes later. But Corita survived and was transferred to another vessel. He was determined to continue his attack on Leyte. The American submarines continued to attack. By the end of the engagement, the Darter and Dace had also sunk a heavy cruiser, the Takao. They also hit the light cruiser, Maya, which sank in less than five minutes. By dawn on October 23rd, Halsey knew that the Japanese were on the prowl and were heading towards Leyte. Halsey brought his third fleet closer to Leyte Island and began to prepare what he called a hot reception. On the morning of the 24th, Halsey was told by one of his reconnaissance pilots that Corita's force was still heading for San Bernardino Strait. So Halsey issued orders to concentrate on the attack. Meanwhile, Corita's forces steamed on. Soon after Halsey had issued his orders, a U.S. task group was attacked by Japanese land-based aircraft. Most of the aircraft were shot down. But one slipped through the wall of anti-aircraft fire and dropped a bomb on the flight deck of the carrier Princeton. First, it appeared that the Princeton was only slightly damaged, but a raging fire started and the carrier was still under attack. A U.S. destroyer and the cruiser Birmingham came alongside to fight the fire. Suddenly, there was a huge explosion and the Princeton and Birmingham were taken out of action. The Princeton would later sink. During the Princeton incident, the Birmingham and other task group vessels were attacked by Admiral Ozawa's carrier aircraft from the Japanese decoy force. These raids drew Halsey's attention towards Ozawa's northern approach. Exactly what Kurita wanted. Meanwhile, Nishimura's force Charlie and Kurita's Alpha Force were also spotted and attacked. Once it was confirmed that Nishimura was heading for Surigao Strait, Kincaid ordered the bombardment and fire support group led by Rear Admiral Jesse Oldendorf to intercept him. 
Oldendorf commanded an extraordinary mix of old battleships, heavy and light cruisers, torpedo firing destroyers, and PT boats. The unsuspecting Nishimura group first came into view at 10.50 p.m. on the 24th. For the rest of the night, it had to run the gauntlet of incessant attacks. The Japanese were assaulted by both torpedoes and the guns of the destroyers. Japanese ships began suffering casualties. Finally, Oldendorf's big ships broke the back of Nishimura's command. Shima's second strike force then withdrew to avoid a similar fate. The battle within Surigao Strait was a clear-cut victory for the Americans and a terrible blow to Kurita's plan. Worse for Kurita, at about the same time the Princeton and Birmingham were undergoing their ordeal, Kurita's ships also came under attack from 250 of Halsey's carrier-borne aircraft as the Japanese steamed through the Saboyan Sea. Halsey's planes carried out a devastating series of attacks. Halsey's pilots reported that the Japanese were withdrawing. The optimistic report soon led to unfortunate consequences. Buoyed by his pilot's reports, Halsey was ready to write off Kurita's forces, even though his night search planes radioed that Kurita was once again heading for the San Bernardino Strait. Bull Halsey now lived up to his name by deciding to destroy Ozawa's carrier force in the north. Halsey took the bait, hook, line, and sinker. He raced off to seek and destroy Ozawa with his whole fleet in tow. Back in Leyte Gulf, the sailors of the 7th Fleet were unaware that San Bernardino Strait was now wide open and that their vital protective screen was gone. The flaws of the command and control of the Leyte operation combined with Halsey's aggressive impetuousness at the worst possible moment. Worse, earlier on the 24th, Halsey had issued a proposed battle plan to his task force commanders. In it, he stated that Task Force 34, with four battleships, five cruisers, and 14 destroyers, would be formed to take on Kurita's fleet should it appear again. The message was intended for his third fleet commanders only, but a copy was sent to Admiral Nimitz. Though not on the address list, Kincaid also got the message. As a result, both the U.S. Naval High Command and the 7th Fleet's Kincaid believed that Task Force 34 was standing watch for Japanese attempts to enter the San Bernardino Strait. It looked as though Halsey had made a crucial blunder. As he raced off to challenge Ozawa's decoy carrier force, the amphibious force supporting the landings was virtually defenseless. Kurita's efforts to strike from the south had been thwarted, and the Japanese fleet had suffered heavy losses but his own force was now steaming undetected and unchallenged through the San Bernardino Strait. Kurita still had a good chance of scoring a decisive victory over Halsey and the U.S. invasion fleet. Early on October 25, 1944, Kurita and the outgunned Japanese naval force appeared to be on the verge of a surprising victory against Halsey and the U.S. invasion fleet. Kurita's Strike Force Alpha continued to steam ahead through the San Bernardino Strait and into the Philippine Sea. At 3 a.m., it headed south toward Leyte Gulf, but the earlier attacks had rattled Kurita. 
Although he had met no challenges so far, he remained cautious. To his south sat three groups of American Jeep carriers and their escorts. One of them, a task unit codenamed Taffy 3, was commanded by Rear Admiral Clifton Sprague. It consisted of six slow, thin-skinned escort carriers, three destroyers, and four destroyer escorts. Sprague's motley force was now the only line of defense between Corita and Leyte. But Sprague was outranged by Corita's battleships and cruisers with their massive 18 and 14-inch guns. Halsey's third fleet, absent from its post, could do nothing as the battle off Samar Island began. Desperately, Sprague ordered his carriers to lay down smoke to impede Corita's ships. Sprague's force was isolated and taking heavy casualties. As Corita closed in, Sprague and Admiral Kincaid sent frantic messages to Halsey for help. They still thought Halsey had sent Task Force 34 to guard against Corita's approach. But Halsey's third fleet was now engaged in battle with Ozawa's carrier force in the north. Disaster seemed imminent for the U.S. naval force off late. Sprague had no option but to defend himself with his own carrier aircraft and his surface vessels. Most of his planes were aloft in minutes, but many were unarmed after being launched too quickly. The developing battle began to look like a naval version of David versus Goliath. Sprague's inadequately armed destroyers took on Corita's mighty battleships and cruisers. Before long, virtually all of Sprague's ships were sunk or badly damaged. Amongst them, the jeep carrier Gambier Bay was sunk after taking 26 hits from Corita's heavy guns. Within three hours, Sprague's gallant force was facing annihilation. All he could hope for was help from Halsey. But Halsey was heavily involved in his own battle with Ozawa's carrier decoy force in the north. Ozawa launched his remaining carrier aircraft. Halsey did the same. They were soon engaged in a deadly game. Halsey's planes were destined to win in the air against Ozawa's carriers. All four were sunk. While Ozawa's ships were being pounded, Halsey was being pursued by frantic signals pleading for help from Task Force 34. Everyone but those in the Third Fleet still thought 34 was close to late. Nimitz intervened. He sent a signal to Halsey asking, where is, repeat, where is Task Force 34? The world wonders. Halsey was furious at the tone of the message but now he was aware of the plight in the south and took action. He formed and dispatched Task Force 34. At Samar, a beleaguered Sprague thought that his rapidly dwindling force was about to be utterly destroyed by Corita's fleet. Yet Corita had begun to waver. From the outset of his attack, he was convinced that he was facing Halsey's main carrier force and was being lured into a trap. With victory in his grasp, he suddenly lost his nerve. He ordered his ships to break off the engagement and withdraw. Halsey pursued Corita as he attempted to return through San Bernardino Strait. Task Force 34 harried Corita and finally arrived to support Kincaid's 7th Fleet. At the time, Japanese land-based aircraft were taking off to attack Sprague's depleted force. 
As Karita's force withdrew, Sprague's battered Taffy III was hit by the first full-scale kamikaze attacks of the war. It was a terrifying new form of warfare. A kamikaze pilot managed to make it through a massive curtain of anti-aircraft fire. He homed in on the escort carrier San Lo. Despite American flak and heavy machine guns, the kamikaze aircraft kept on coming. It crashed into the San Lo and went through her upper decks. It lodged in the main aircraft hangar before exploding. The San Lo sank in less than 20 minutes and hundreds of her crew were killed. The kamikaze attacks continued. They would become a dreadful tactic in the final months of the Pacific War. But despite this tragic end to the battle, the Japanese Imperial Navy had been dealt a fatal blow. Korita's losses were enormous. Three Japanese battleships, four carriers, 11 destroyers, and a submarine had been sunk. Virtually all of the surviving vessels were damaged, some irreparably. Over 10,500 Japanese seamen and aircrew had been lost. All the remaining carrier-based aircraft were shot down or lost on the sinking carriers. The battle had hurt the United States, too. It had lost three light carriers, two destroyers, one destroyer escort, and 200 aircraft. Almost 3,000 U.S. sailors and air crew were killed, and over 1,000 wounded. But despite U.S. losses, the U.S. Navy had virtually destroyed the Japanese Imperial Navy. Halsey had played a major role in the victory. With his aggressive leadership, William Bull Halsey continued to inspire further successes after Leyte Gulf. He swept the South China Seas and the coast of the Malayan Peninsula so effectively that Japan could no longer supply its overseas garrisons. By the end of the war, his forces were shelling the Japanese home islands. In late 1945, Halsey retired at age 63 after 45 years of service. He remained uncompromising toward the Japanese to the very end. He was a firm supporter of the use of atomic bombs. We must make that nation of beasts so impotent that they never again will be able to rise up. After a successful business career and then retirement, Halsey died on Long Island Sound in 1959. Takeo Kurita remained in command with the ever-depleted Second Fleet until January 1945. He then became chief instructor at Japan's Naval Academy until the end of the war. Kurita retired following the Japanese surrender in September 1945. Afterward, he lived quietly in Japan until his death in 1977. Leyte Gulf had been Japan's final gamble to halt the relentless American drive towards Japan itself. It failed dramatically. Thereafter, the way was clear for the U.S. military to advance on Japan. For Bull Halsey, it had been a tense but ultimately triumphant clash of warriors. But for Takeo Kurita, it was a loss that guaranteed the death of the Imperial Japanese Navy.